every wrongful conviction case you look at, the obvious question is how could it could have been prevented? You have erroneous eyewitness identification, false confessions, junk science, jailhouse snitch testimony, inadequate defense counsel, a long list. The question I was going to ask Ronald and Jennifer, could this have been prevented? Yes, the, it could have been prevented. Today's event is co-hosted by the Virginia Institutionalized Persons Project of the Legal Aid Justice Center. And Alex Gulata is here. And we have a, I won't introduce them one by one, but we have a number of local judges, prosecutors, police chiefs, and detectives who are especially interested uh, in this, in this uh, topic. And so we're delighted to have uh, them here today. There will be a book signing following the uh, forum today. And so please let the speakers exit out. And we've got the place where you buy books strategically placed, so you have to pass by it to get out of the building. Uh, Wednesday's forum will be at 5.30 in the afternoon. Jim Murray, a local entrepreneur uh, who was Mark Warner's business partner, written a book called Wireless Nation, the frenzied launch of the cellular revolution, came out about eight years ago, terrific book. Uh, he and Mark Giles, who was the founding chairman and CEO of uh, Virginia National Bank will be here to talk about the economic recession and the administration's reaction to it. So that should be uh, very interesting. Welcome to the Miller Center Forum. Uh, I've asked John Grisham to introduce today's guests. Uh, John is well known internationally, a former small town lawyer and member of the Mississippi State Legislature. His name is now synonymous with the modern legal thriller. He's written 20 books of fiction, nine of which have been made into movies. Uh, while many of us in the Academy are thrilled if we sell 235 books, John Grisham has sold 235 million. John uh, Grisham has a deep personal interest in matters of the law and justice, and has taken a particular interest in the Legal Aid and Justice Center here in Charlottesville. John Grisham's 2006 work of nonfiction, The Innocent Man, shines a very bright spotlight on many of the issues addressed by today's speakers. Unreliable eyewitness testimony, false confessions, wrongful picks out of the lineup, wrongful incarceration. Please welcome John Grisham. Thank you, George. Delighted to be here um, at the Miller Center. Uh, as of last week, we have had 235 exonerations of innocent people by DNA testing. Ronald Cotton was number 23 in 1995. I wrote about number 99, who got out 10 years ago and died five years later. Since I wrote that book, I have become active in the innocence movement because I've become convinced that there are thousands of innocent people in prison. Most of you don't believe that, but it's true. I travel around the country speaking to the various innocence projects uh, because they're all, un uh, they're all underfunded. Our society is not structured to have innocence projects because we're not geared to confront wrongful convictions. As I travel around the country, I meet a lot of exonerees. And I always listen to their stories. And their stories are always, uh, these are wonderful stories from a storytelling perspective. They involve, they start with violence. Uh, they involve um, dishonesty. They involve um, emotional destruction, wrongful conviction, all these great tragic elements that come together to make a good story for those of us who are always looking for stories. They're sad, they're terrible stories, but they're all compelling. The man in Ohio who spent 25 years for a crime that never occurred. I'm gonna write my top 10 wrongful conviction stories one of these days. And the best one is here in Virginia, in Norfolk. The case of the Norfolk Four, the four sailors, three of whom were serving life without parole for a rape and murder they had nothing to do with. It's a tragedy that we, we should all be ashamed of. The story you're about to hear is probably the most unusual. 
uh, the most unique. When these guys, almost always men, get out of prison, they are reluctantly released because no one wants to admit that a mistake has been made. They rarely get an apology. I think someone may have apologized to Ronald. That's unusual. We simply want them to go away and shut up. Most of the time, they don't get a dime. They have no support. Many of them have no families. Again, they're not supposed to exist in our system. And after the euphoria of getting out, many of them off of death row where they thought they were going to die. They can't believe they're out. They knew they were innocent. But for 12, 15, 20 years, and they're finally out. Once the euphoria fades away, they have some pretty rough lives. There's no system to support. This is one of the better stories. It starts with violence and emotional destruction, a dishonesty, a wrongful conviction, retribution, retribution by the victim, and then some doubt, and then an exoneration. And then this remarkable story of redemption and the courage to ask for forgiveness and the courage to grant it. It ends up with what we have today, a deep and abiding friendship. I would love to tell you this story, but I don't want to steal somebody else's thunder, okay? <laughs> Instead, I'm going to introduce to you Ronald Cotton and Jennifer Thompson Canino. Everybody. This is so exciting. I can't believe I'm actually here. And that John Grisham just introduced me. <laughs> so exciting. Um, if someone had told me 25 years ago that I would be speaking before, you know, such a diverse group of incredibly brilliant people um, with my best friend in the front row, I would say, you know, this, that's just not possible. But, um, but here I am. And um, so I wanted to start off kind of telling you a little bit about um, how this all started for me. I certainly never intended to become a public speaker, um, an activist, nor a co-author of a book. Um, but nine years ago, I was sitting on my deck. It was in June, and I was actually getting ready to do a, um, a documentary for the BBC about human memory. And I received this phone call from a, a man who I'd never known. His name was Dick Burr. He was out of Houston, Texas. And he called me and he said, you know, is this Jennifer Thompson? I said, yes. He said, we've got this case in Houston, Texas. There's a man that's going to be executed in 22 days um, based on a single eyewitness identification. Wanted to know if you would come down and tell your story. And I, and I thought, well, now who in the world wants to hear my story? And frankly, I was an advocate for the death penalty system because I believed in the United States of America Certainly, we would never put someone to death or on death row if there was any doubt, not a reasonable doubt, but any doubt. So I said, sure, I'll come down and I'll tell my story. They sent me the case file and I read up on it on the flight over to Houston. Now, I knew that Ronald Cotton had been an exoneree. I knew that he had been an innocent person, but frankly, I really didn't think there was this huge plethora of innocent people sitting in prison for years and years and decades of their lives. So I felt fairly confident about going down and telling my story. Went to the hotel, uh, checked in, and was asked if I'd come down and have dinner. And I said, sure, I'll come and have dinner. And I went downstairs, and I was seated at a table of 12 men and women I'd never seen before in my life. They were young, they were old, they were black, they were white, they were from different parts of the country. And I sat down and ordered my dinner, and. Rob Warden, who works at the Central and Wrongful Convictions out of Northwestern University in Chicago, Illinois, came in and said, gosh, thanks, everybody, for being here. What I'd like for you to do is everybody kind of stand up one at a time and tell us why you're here. So the first person to stand up was a man named Kirk Bloodsworth. And he stood up and he said, my name is Kirk Bloodsworth. I was sentenced to die in the gas chamber of Maryland for the rape and murder of a nine-year-old little girl based on an eyewitness identification. I thought, wow, that's a terrible story. Kevin Green stood up. He had been a Marine. He had been sentenced to life in San Quentin. He spent 16 years for the rape and bludgeoning of his wife and the subsequent death of an unborn daughter on an eyewitness identification. Joyce Ann Brown stood up. She spent nine years in a women's correctional facility in Texas because of a double murder of a shopkeeper and his wife, eyewitness identification. And I saw 
where this was leading. After the 12th person had introduced themselves and talked about the lengthy period of time they had spent in prison, some of them were on death row for 17 years, one man was within two hours of his execution, he had eaten his last meal, they told me, now you tell them who you are. <laughs> and I thought, no, that's just not possible. I'm not that strong, I'm not that courageous. And they said, well, you are, you just don't know it yet. So I stood up and I began to tell them my story, which began in 1984 as a 22-year-old college student at Elon College in a small town called Burlington, North Carolina. I lived alone, lived independently, single life, really loved it. I was making a 4.0 GPA, straight A's. I was dating a student in graduate school at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, worked two jobs, life was great, I had my direction, I had my goals, I was set until the early morning hours of July 29th, 1984, when I felt a presence in my bedroom. I had gone to bed that night with a terrible headache. And somewhere between being awake and being asleep, I felt there was someone in this room with me. I tried to will myself to go back to sleep, wondering if there was someone in this room, could I possibly emit any type of scream out of my throat? At that moment, something brushed my arm and I looked to the side of my bed and I saw someone's head creeping beside my mattress and I screamed. The man jumped up, straddled my body, put a knife to my throat, covered my mouth and told me to shut up or he was going to kill me. Processing is nanoseconds when these things happen. And I thought, wow, gosh, um, this person has tried to rob me and that's got to be what it is. If I offer him everything I own, he'll just quietly slip away and leave me unharmed. And I offered him my car, my credit card, my money, anything. Please don't hurt me. I won't call the police. And he said, I don't want your money. And as a woman, you know what's getting ready to happen to you. There are many women in this audience right now. And just by the percentage that we know of sexual assault victims, I know you're here with me now. You know what's going to happen to you. What I didn't know was, was I going to die? Was this the last thing I would ever see before I died? Would this be how my parents would come and identify my body? Would my mother and father have to stand over me and say, yep, that's her. And at that moment, I decided two things. One is if there was a way to survive, I would survive. And two, if I survived, this man was going to prison forever. I stayed focused. As a sexual assault victim, it's, it's highly uh, counterintuitive to stay present while your soul and your spirit and your body is being assaulted. But I stayed present because it was important that I remember everything about this person's face. I needed to know the shape of his eyes. I needed to know his hair. I needed to know if there was a tattoo or a scar, a missing tooth facial hair, height, weight, age, color, they were all important. And as I began to study this, because it was the most important test I would ever take in my life, I began to create an image of what this monster looked like. At one point during the rape, he attempted to kiss me and it revolted me so bad, I turned my head to the side and he said, relax, I won't hurt you. And I often tell people that at that moment, I knew God was trying to tell me something. It was my moment. I needed to get him off of me. I told him, if you'll take the knife and you'll walk down the front steps of my house and you'll drop the knife on my car, I'll let you come back in. And he believed me. He had to get off of me first. I wrapped a blanket around myself and actually stood close enough to him to figure out how tall he was. How were his feet splayed? Were his arms particularly long? What color were his shoes? What kind of pants was he wearing? He didn't drop the knife on the hood of my car. He simply pretended to drop it out of my home, came back in and grabbed my arms and said, let's go. And I wasn't going back in that room. I have to go to the bathroom, I told him. Please, can I go to the bathroom? I needed to think. As I went to the bathroom, I turned the light on. It was just a moment, it was a second, but I knew it was important. I knew light was important. 
He told me to turn the light off, and I went in and I began to think, what am I going to do? How am I going to get out of here? And I remembered he had said, I came through your kitchen. And my way out was his way in, and I had to get to the kitchen. Uh, can I m make a drink of water first, please? And he said, sure. Make me a Seagram's, and we'll have a party. OK, I said. I went into the kitchen, and I knew to turn the light on. Light was going to give me space. It was going to give me time. It was going to give me distance. And as I began to think, what am I going to do? I began to make noise with water and ice and drawers and cabinets and anything as I slowly opened the door and I prayed and I ran. And within seconds, he was behind me. I didn't know where I was going to go. I'm wearing a blanket. It's 3.30 in the morning. It started to rain. I knew he had the knife. I knew he was stronger than me, bigger than me. He had been drinking. And I knew if he caught me, I would die. So I ran to a light. I didn't know who lived there, but I felt confident that under that light, if he killed me, somebody might see him. And I began to bang on the door, praying someone was home. The man came to the door, and he looked at me, and I said, please, let me in. I've just been raped. He's after me. And he screamed. His wife came around the corner and looked through the door and said, my god, she's a student at the college. I've seen her before. Let her in. And I fainted. The next thing I knew, I heard sirens. 911 had been called. The police were on their way. He had taken off through the woods. The dogs had given chase, lost his scent. But as they began to ask me for the description of this rapist, it became very clear that I knew exactly what he looked like. Well, he's um, 22, 23 years old, uh, light-skinned African-American male, pencil-thin mustache and short, close-cropped hair, almond-shaped eyes, about 175, 185 pounds, 5'11", 6 feet tall. He's wearing a navy blue shirt with white stripes on the sleeves, white gloves, dark khaki green pants, and, and canvas boat shoes. I went to the hospital. Rape kit was done as the rape kit was being performed because now my body had become a crime scene and it was important to collect evidence off of my body, I heard a woman crying down the hall. And I asked the detective, I said, the woman who's crying, what happened to her? And he said, she's just been raped. And I said, was it the same man who raped me? And he said, yes, it was. You cannot imagine the bitter hate that I was feeling. It was palatable. I could taste it. I hated him. He needed to die. He needed to be destroyed. And I began to work with the police, putting together a composite sketch of what this man looked like. And it ran in the paper. Within a day, we were getting phone calls. But the most important phone call came through. It was a woman who said, you know, the composite sketch looks like a neighbor of mine by the name of Ronald Cotton. As a matter of fact, I saw him on a bicycle at 3 o'clock in the morning around Brookwood Garden condominiums wearing a navy blue shirt with white stripes on the sleeves and dark khaki pants and white gloves. It was him. We knew it. I was called to the police station on August 1st to do a photo lineup. I had never been in a police department. I had never done a photo lineup. But I knew I was there for a reason. He was in the lineup. I had to find him. And I did. And I picked up that picture and I said, this is him. Are you sure? Jennifer, I said, I'm positive. That's the man. Good job. We thought that was him. A week later, I was asked to do a physical lineup. I was taken to a small school. The police department was being renovated. And downstairs in the basement, a table separated me and seven men in a physical lineup. I was given instructions that if I saw him, I was to write his number on a piece of paper. And it was number five. I saw him. I wrote it on a piece of paper. I handed it to, to the detectives. And they said, great job. That's the guy you picked out in the photo lineup. I passed the test. I knew it. I knew I could do this. The second victim had not been able to give a description. She had been slapped, bitten, smothered. I had to carry this for me, and for her, and for you, and for you, and for you. It was important. They had to remove him from the streets so he could never hurt another woman. Ronald Cotton was arrested. He awaited trial in January of 1985, two weeks of my life. 
two days on the stand, but I was going to hang in there. I was going to make sure that he was put away forever. And having to describe every detail of what he had done to me that night, watching my parents cry, I hated him even more. I hated him. I wanted him to die. Ronald Cotton was found guilty within 45 minutes. First degree rape, first degree breaking and entering, first degree sexual assault. Ronald Cotton was given life in 54 years. And we had champagne. We toasted the judicial system because it worked. I was the victim and I deserved this. Ronald Cotton was a terrible human being and he deserved to go away for the rest of his life. He was never going to be married, he was never going to have children, he was never going to be free, and that's exactly what he deserved. I began to try to put my life back together and I would go home at night and I would pray. I would pray for my family, for my friends, and I'd pray for Ronald Cotton to die every night. I'd pray for him to die before he left this earth. I wanted him to experience what I had experienced. It was important that he know what that's like to have the most precious thing taken from you. The appellate court overturned the decision in 1987. We went back to trial. This time we had to try both cases because they felt it was important that the jury know the second victim had not been positive. But during these three years, there had been this mystery man by the name of Bobby Poole who apparently had confessed to a cellmate that he had actually committed the crime that Ronald Cotton was serving time for, but we knew. Um, innocent people don't go to prison. Only guilty people go to prison. So under Vordeer in 1987, Bobby Poole was brought in front of me and I was asked, do you recognize this person, Jennifer? And I said, no, sir, I've never seen him before in my life. Do you see the man in the courtroom today who raped you? And I said, yes, he's sitting at the defense table. It's Ronald Cotton. Ronald Cotton was found guilty of two first-degree rapes, two first-degree sexual offenses, two first-degree break and enterings. Ronald Cotton was given two life sentences in 35 years. And again, it was time for champagne. The system worked. Life again moved on. I got married in 88. I got pregnant in 89. I had triplets in the spring of 1990. They were my gift from God. They were they were this incredible reward because I was a good person and Ronald Cotton would never have this and he didn't deserve it. My life became manic as you can imagine with feedings and diapers and toys and ear infections and I loved every moment of it. In the spring of 1995, they came to me and they said, you know, have you ever heard of DNA? And I said, well, yeah, O.J. Simpson used it, yeah. Well, Ronald is still maintaining his innocence, and he would like a DNA test run. I said, sure, run it. I don't care. I know what it's going to show. It's going to show what I have known for 11 years, that the face I'd seen in my nightmares, the person I'd prayed to die, was a monster. So off went the DNA test. And in June of 1995, they stood in my kitchen, Detective Galden and the Assistant District Attorney of Alamance County, and they looked at me and they said, we're wrong. It wasn't Ronald Cotton. It was Bobby Poole's DNA. Well, then, if that's true, if Ronald Cotton is innocent and Bobby Poole is guilty, and I just knew for sure that that was not true, then maybe my children aren't my children, and maybe God's not God, and then everything I've ever believed in is wrong. And people like to ask me, what did you do? How did you feel? How do you feel? What do you do? The days I could manage, I was busy. But the nights when I got really quiet, I knew that Ronald had lost 11 years and nothing I could do, nothing I could say would ever bring them back. And I asked people what I should do, what should I say, and they said, you know, don't worry about it. Ronald Cotton had not been a nice guy. I mean, he got 11 years in prison. They feed you three times a day. And you get to play basketball in prison. You can even get an education. And if he hadn't committed that crime on, you know, against you, he probably committed another crime he never got caught for. So. It's a wash. And I thought, no, that's not going to work. But I still didn't do anything. I was scared. I just knew that behind every street corner, down every dark alley, Ronald Cotton was waiting there because he was going to kill me for what had happened to him. So I didn't do anything. We participated in a documentary titled What Jennifer Saw. And I only agreed to do this under one 
condition. And that is Ronald Cotton and I never get together to do this because I was afraid and I knew he hated me and I didn't want to deal with that. And so we did. And what Jennifer saw aired in February of 1997, and the last thing I say is, I know Ronald's innocent, but I still see his face in my nightmares. And I realized that's wrong. But how do I, how do I extract that out of my mind? Where do I place it? Where does it go? So I asked for a private meeting. I need to see Ronald Cotton. But I don't know what I'm going to say. I don't even know what I'm going to call him. As I sat in a pastor study in a small church not far from where I had been raped, I saw this very tall black man get out of a truck, standing beside his very tiny wife. And I thought, oh my god, he's too tall. Why had I not seen that? Why did I not know that? As he came into the room, I physically could not move. And I looked up at him and I said, Ronald, if I spend every second of every minute of every hour of every day of every week for the rest of my life telling you how sorry I am, it wouldn't come close to how my heart feels. And Ronald did the one thing I never anticipated. He took my hands and with tears in his eyes, he said, I forgive you. Well, I forgave you years ago. I'm not angry at you. I don't hate you. I want you to have a good life. I want you to be happy. I want to be happy. And you don't need to fear me, because I will never hurt you. Over the next two hours, Ronald and I shared this pain under the same victimization of a flawed judicial system. You see, that summer when Ronald Cotton was waiting to be tried, Bobby Poole raped seven other women. While we were thinking we were so safe, because Ronald Cotton had been removed, we weren't. Over the last 13 years, Ronald and I have worked very hard on teaching how the system fails, what happens when the system fails, what are the things we can do to make the system better, but most importantly, the capacity and the transformation and the healing power of forgiveness. Ronald Cotton showed me how I could forgive Bobby Poole, not because he asked for it, not because he deserved it, but because I wasn't going to stay a victim. That had I continued to hate, I would have stayed locked in that one moment in time, and he would have destroyed me like he had started in July of 1984. So in Houston, Texas, as I spoke and told my story, I realized the enormous wrong we are inflicting upon thousands and thousands of innocent people throughout our country, and many of them will never find. Some of them are dead. We have executed them. Gary Graham was executed 22 days after I went to Houston, Texas. So Ronald and I go around teaching, trying to explain the flaws, talking about a death penalty system that doesn't work in our book as a way of healing and teaching. So at this moment, I really would be honored to introduce you to my best friend, Ronald Cotton. Thank you all for coming out. And most of all, I want to thank the good Lord for DNA. If it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be here today. But uh, my story began on July, I mean, August the 1st, 1984. I arrived home that morning about noon, and my mother's boyfriend was standing outside enjoying the fresh air. And me and my girlfriend went been out at night, and I told her I, I couldn't drive my car because my transmission was out. And so, at that particular time, I didn't have any transportation but a 10-speed bicycle. And so I had my shirt on my shoulder. I get out the car. I kiss her, and I say, I'll see you later. As I approach in the apartment, um, my mother's boyfriend, he said, Ron, he said, the cops are looking for you. And I said, for what? And he said, for a rape. I said, man, I didn't commit such a crime. And he said, well, they came in the apartment, took a pair of your shoes, 
my shoes and your sister's shoes. I said, okay. Uh, he said, you ought to go down and find out what's up. I said, well, I'm not going to ride no bicycle to no police department. <laughs> so uh, I noticed a neighbor standing outside. She was sweeping off her front porch. And so my instinct was to ask her to borrow her car because I did have a driver's license. So I walked over and I said, excuse me, I said, Patricia, I said, is it possible that I can use your car to go to the police department? I hear that they have me as a prime suspect in a rape that was committed in the community. She said, sure, you know, just make sure that you have my car back before 3 o'clock because I have to go to work. I said, okay. So I went and asked my sister, Tootie. I said, Tootie, I said, come and go with me to the police department. I said, I want to find out what's going on. They said, I committed this crime upon this lady. I don't know, I never saw a day in my life. So I reached, grabbed the paper off the television, and I was reading it, and I said, no, I said, they got the wrong guy for this crime. I said, I did not commit this crime. And so we proceeded on to the police department, and I told her, I said, we'll go by my girlfriend's house and find out what's up with her. And so once we arrived, my girlfriend, she came out running, crying, telling me the cops have been over looking for me. I said, I know. I said, I'm on my way to the police department trying to get this matter taken care of. And so she hops in the car along with us, and once we arrive at the police department, we, we get out the car, and I looks up at the building and notice some of the police officers looking out the window. They recognize me, and they scattered and start running to the door. And after I met at the door with them, he identified himself as Detective Gold, and I said, yeah, my name is Ronald Cotton. I hear y'all looking for me. I come down to trying to find out what's up. He said, yes, come on in, let's talk about it. So we goes up in the room, and they interrogated me, offered me soft drink cigarettes. And I told him where I was at on that day that I thought in question. So um, he took me in another room with another detective, and I told him something totally different. So therefore, that led them to believe that I was lying. But even though I got my weekends confused, so they took me in a room and showed me evidence that they had received from Jennifer's house. Uh, a pair of shoes that had been cut from head to toe and, and showed me a piece of foam cushion said that this was found in Jennifer apartment that came out of my shoe. And I told the detective, I said, that came out of my shoe and found in Jennifer's house because you put it there. I said, I haven't been in Jennifer's house. I don't know. I never saw a day in my life. He said, well, he said, we have your ass. I said, well, you can say what you want to say. So he called in a uniform officer and said, lock him up. I was fingerprinted, photographed, handcuffed, and taken to the Adelance County Jail. And once that, I was put on a $150,000 bond, go to a proper cause hearing, try to get a bond reduction. It was increased to $450,000. So I'm stuck in jail. They, they must thought I was a millionaire because I couldn't post a bill like that. You know, my family, they came to visit me and said, Ron, just be strong, keep your head up. You know, we behind you 100%. And the day of the physical lineup, uh, we was instructed to step forward and do a 360-degree turn and state a statement that had been typed on a piece of card that tried to do a voice identification. And my attorney, he was present at that moment. And once Jennifer wrote the number down, I showed it to the detective. He took it. He looks at me. He walks over to my attorney, shows him. My attorney drops his head. And then I knew I had been selected as a guy who committed the crime upon her. I went back to jail, I laid in jail for many, many months, tension building up, frustration. My lawyer came to me one day, he said, Ron, I was out for lunch. Ran into the dead, hey, he offered a plea bargain. I said, what are you talking about? He said, life sentence. I said, no way. I said, you might as well get that judge and that jury and let's get the rolling because I'm not going out like that. So we go to trial, found guilty. The judge, he said, Mr. Cotton, do you have anything to say to the courts? I stood up. I said, yes, I do, Your Honor. I'd just like to have your permission to sing this song. And he said, sure. And I had written a poem to my girl titled, Until You Come Back. But I changed the words and titled it, Until God Came in My Life. And I sung that song as my attorney sat down on each side of me with the head down. And you know, I guess I embarrassed him. So I went back to jail, and I told the people that you know, I was found guilty. They said, well, you don't act like it. They said, how much time did you get? I said, a life sentence. They said, well, you're laughing and smiling. I said, I'm doing that to keep from crying. The very next day, I wrote a letter to the head jailer, and I told him, I've been locked up for a crime I did not commit. I've been tried, convicted, and sentenced, and I'm ready to go to prison and start serving my time. 
I said, McCall, I'm just ready to get out of here. I said, if not, I'm going to start turning this jail up. I was ready to get out, go on to the prison, start my sentence. And that's what happened the very next day. I was at Central Prison. And 90 days after my conviction in, in prison, I happened to be walking down a tunnel at Central Prison in Raleigh, North Carolina, and I happened to notice a correction officer escorting an inmate. I glanced over, and I recognized him. I said, I've saw this guy before. Uh, two days later, I was out on the population playing a handball game and noticed him standing out in the, public, out there in the population. And I told someone to come and retreat, you know, release me from the game. And I approached him. I said, excuse me. I said, but uh, where are you from? He said, I'm from Burlington. I said, I am myself. I said, you kind of resemble the drawing of a composite sketch of a crime I was committed, you know, falsely of. And you resemble this guy. I said, did you commit this crime? He said, no, I didn't. So I went to my dorm and went into my files that I had from researching cases and pulled this photo out and the composite, composite sketch and looked at it. I say it looks very much like him. And as time went by, uh, he became friends with a guy that knew the law very well, trying to get him back in court. Me and this guy got to fighting, and 30 days later, he come back and apologized and tells me that Poole had confessed to him about me serving time for a crime he committed. So my father, he, he pays me a visit. I done made me a weapon. I'm ready to take this guy's life. My father, he said, Ron, he said, you tell me you're innocent. I believe you're innocent. But if you take this man's life, that's why you're going to spend the rest of yours. I went back to my dorm. I thought about it. I laid in my bunk every night with my weapon laying across my chest. This guy sleeping in the same dorm. And every time he walked by my bunk, if I was there, I would tell him if I get an opportunity, he was mine. But I also considered what my father had told me. And I said, well, he's not worth it. So I walked to the restroom and found a drain hole in the floor, dropped a weapon into it, because I could have easily sold it for $30, $40. You know, eight mini bags of chips, candy bars, whatever, but it wasn't worth that. So they transferred me to another unit. And this guy, he was there also. He was constantly standing in the background, watching me from a distance. You know, when you're somewhere, you feel like someone's watching. You look around to try to locate who that individual is. So, I just told the lieutenant of the prison unit that uh, I couldn't handle it. I said, you all are supposed to be transferring me on the side that this guy's on. I said, but I'm letting you know now ahead of time, if you do, it's not going to be good. So I eventually got transferred to Tennessee, Mason, that is. And that's the last time I was in prison. I, I wrote to the courts and my attorney for a DNA test. And after learning from DNA from the OJ case, they wrote me a letter and said, well, Mr. Cotton, uh, we're going to grant you a wish. We're going to do this testing. But if the results come back stating that you're the man that committed this crime, this is why you're going to spend the rest of your life. I didn't think twice about it because I knew I was innocent. So I, I wrote him back and said, put your foot down and go with it. I said, if it come back anything different, someone tampered with it. So about three weeks to a month rolled by. My attorney wrote me a letter and said, hey, you're going back to court. Uh, that particular night, the warden of the prison Called me in his office. I went in and he told me, he said, no. he said, you're going home tomorrow. He said, a guy that committed the crime and put you in prison for has confessed. So what I want you to do for me now is tell me the officers that are bringing drugs in. I said, I'm not going to be your snitch. <laughs> <laughs> so I told him I wasn't going to be his snitch. And I admit, you know, things like that do happen in prison. Officers bringing stuff in and, you know, eventually they get caught. But so he got mad at me and told the officer, take him back to his dorm. Uh, I went back to my dorm and I started handing out belongings that I had accumulated in prison. You know, I ran three canteens. I started with five bucks. I had people working for me. Uh, I was, you know, trying to do the right thing, but, you know, I couldn't rely upon my family to, you know, send me their hard earned dollars, you know. So I started making homemade wine and, and selling it. Uh, you know, I was doing what I could to survive in prison, you know, because. My family had their lives, and I, here I am with a life sentence. And you know, the day that I went to prison with a life sentence, my little baby brother, he went to the military. And actually, he's still in that right day. He's supposed to be in support, deported to Afghanistan just Friday, which, you know, I, I know he's ready to get out of there. But other than that, you know, I'm glad that DNA is out. And now that, you know, people like you all are trying to change the law and help innocent people that are in prison. And I just thank God for that. And that is my story. Thank you.
I had a very hard time keeping dry eyes. <laughs> very, very powerful story. Uh, will those who would like to ask questions of uh, Ron and Jennifer and John, uh, please go to the back of the room and I will meet you back there and we'll have time for a, a good number of questions. Uh, let me start the uh, conversation, uh, Ron and Jennifer, by asking about the role that religious faith uh, played in your ability to survive and construct your friendship. Um, well, for me, it was really less about religion and it was more about faith. Um, and Ron and I have talked about this in the last few years that, you know, throughout our journey, it's become very, very clear that God's fingerprints were all over our story. I have no idea how I survived. I don't know why um, the rape kit was kept. Um, Mike Galden had, it was up to his discretion as to whether to destroy the biological evidence once sentencing had occurred. And he often says just something told him to hang on to it. Um, why one fragment of a sperm had survived to be tested. Uh, why Bobby Poole was in the same dorm as Ronald. And why it was he and I that were chosen to deliver this message. So for me, um, it's just, it's faith. I, I know that he's been present with me all along. And um, so I'll let Ron answer his. Well, for me, uh, my struggle in prison wasn't easy by no means. Uh, there were times that I got in fight defending myself or continuously being false accused for things I didn't do. I also had to inform the stewards in the kitchen that got me mixed up with Poole, calling me Poole, because he worked in the kitchen as well. And as I, I was around this guy for many, many years, uh, it was very difficult to tolerate his presence and staring from a great distance. I must admit, I, I wanted to take him out, and I'm not talking about to eat. Uh, but when I forgave Jennifer, uh, it was like in two years of my prison term, I was sitting on my bunk in Central Prison. I had been corresponding with a, a young lady from out of New York for many years, and it's like a vision came to me of a female. It was just hair, no face. I was trying to figure out why was I seeing this, and I constantly, you know, sang in the band to, you know, keep active and positive because I wanted to survive this falsely incarceration. So I took my problems and prayed to the good Lord that he gave me strength to endure what was on my shoulders that I knew he wouldn't put too much on me that I couldn't bear. So I just asked him to give me the strength and wisdom to forgive Jennifer and move on, irregardless of my incarceration because, you know, my family, they stood by me. I was staying active. I loved my job. I didn't care for being where I was at, but I knew that I had to survive. And Jennifer, you know, I, I prayed for her that the moment would come to where we could forgive each other because I constantly heard officers stating that, you know, she, she's sorry. Uh, she, you know, she's forgiven. Uh, I said, yeah, but I want to hear that from her mouth, you know. It was okay, you know, once I was out and trying to adjust to being back out in society, I uh, wanting to meet Jennifer so desperately to hear those words come out of her mouth instead of an officer that may have appeared on my job because I was working at the Golden Corral, baking yeast rolls and working at the Ramadi and cooking buffets on the weekend. And finally, when that moment came, it was a closure for me, you know, I could move forward in life without tripping over stumps and bumps and humps and whatever. But that's the way it works and that's the way it still is, you know. And the way this story had come together, it's like, we're not legally married, but we all married because we traveled together and, <laughs> <laughs> and you know, we would be, we would be around each other for many, many years, you know, because, you know, that's what we do, you know. She gets out there when she had the opportunity to go on her own. And I don't have all that freedom, you know. It's not like I'm still incarcerated, but I just enjoy, you know, going out, promoting the book with Jennifer. And, you know, we, our families I met and everybody get along, and we just love one another. But I'm going to turn this over. 
Thank you very much for sharing your story. I was wondering, um, to your knowledge, has, has there been any changes made in terms of the way that the lineup process is conducted nowadays um, and the way that I test, eyewitness testimony is processed and how it's considered, what weight it's given? State by state. Um, once Ronald was exonerated, one of the beautiful things, um, I think, is that Mike Galden, who had become the chief of police, mandated sweeping changes across his department before anybody else did, and he put into uh, place what we call best practices. Um, and those of you who aren't familiar with best practices, it's taken the lineups from simultaneous, where you put all the photographs down at one time, um, to uh, sequential, which is one photograph at a time. So, so what that does is it uh, minimizes the ability to compare photographs. Um, so you, you get one photograph, yes or no, you place it down. Um, we also um, instituted double-blind testing. Double-blind testing is when the investigating officer does not administer the lineups. So there can be no verbal and nonverbal attends. They don't know who the, the suspect is. The other thing that changed was audio videotaping of all interrogations, all lineups, and all confessions. And he did that on his own. Um, since then, I've spoken before the police chief's uh, conference in North Carolina a few years ago, and they mandated the basic law enforcement training manual to go to the best practices. Um, we were second behind New Jersey to do that. So we're, we're very proud, but, but frankly, it's, it's really um, oftentimes departments, a smattering here and there, a city here and there, um, that, that, that has changed the practices. John, you've been uh, working on this issue and other venues. Do you want to weigh in on changes that have been made that you're aware of? Every wrongful conviction case you look at, the, the obvious question is, how could, it be, could it have been prevented? Could this have been prevented? Uh, this is a close one. A lot of them, uh, they could easily have been prevented. You have erroneous eyewitness identification. You have false confessions. Jurors do not believe that you will confess to something you didn't do. And when you have a false confession, 80% of the time, you're going to get convicted. Um, junk science is rampant in this country. Terrible expert witnesses. Uh, jailhouse snitch testimony <clears throat> still used all the time. These are thugs looking for deals. Um, inadequate defense counsel, a long list. And so my, the question I was going to ask, Ronald and Jennifer, could this have been prevented? Yes. <laughs> The answer to that is yes. Um, and the problem with my lineup was Bobby Poole was not in the lineup. And we know that when the actual culprit is not in the lineup, what often happens is the, the witness, the victim, will choose the next best face. Okay, but could he have been in the lineup? He probably could have been in the lineup. Um, he was certainly... Um, uh, a criminal. He was certainly had been in and out of the prison system. Um, but for some reason, it was that phone call that came through. We, I did not know for many years until after Ronald was exonerated that that phone call that came through that night um, telling us that, that Ronald had been seen on a bicycle, which he wasn't, was um, a woman who was cutting a deal for her and her son. Uh, one, of the, one of the officers in the police department who's in the book had gone to her ahead of time and offered her a deal if she would be um, an informant. And we didn't know that for many years later, and there's actually a photograph of him sitting in her home while Ron was awaiting trial with her grandchild on her lap. Um, so those are the kind of things that I didn't know about, uh, Ron didn't know about, but they're used all the time. And so yes, the, it could have been prevented. Well, this is so overwhelming all that you're giving us, and thank you for doing that. As a psychologist, I'm concerned about two things. One is um, how, I know we talked religion was part of it, but how you get to that place of forgiveness and maintain that. And number two, I have concerns about when, now that people are getting exonerated, what kind of help there is for people to adjust, because that is a huge adjustment to make after being in incarcerated for such a long time, and what kinds of things can we do to help? Do you have any answers? Not me. 
Um, again, this varies state to state. We have some states that have compensation laws. We have some states that do not. When Ronald was released, he was offered $500 for every year he was wrongfully convicted with a cap of $5,000. It was an antiquated law. Um, I helped with um, some other people to change that through the legislation. Um, it was increased to $10,000 a year, which is still completely inadequate. Um, but it, was, it gave Ronald uh, a beginning. Um, North Carolina has since then changed it twice, so it went to 20 and now to 50. But that's not, that's not a rule. I mean, there are many states that don't compensate these men at all. And there's no programs in place for the exonerees. You have more programs in place if you come out and you were guilty and you can receive services for counseling, job training, bus tickets, housing. These men and women get nothing. And some of these guys are coming out after 38 years. Their families are dead. Their children are grown. They have absolutely no job skills. There's no housing. They get a bus ticket and the jeans they wore when they came in 38 years ago at the age of 14. So it's criminal what we're doing. I mean, in any other, in any other realm, if you take somebody away for something, you know, innocently kidnapping them, it's a crime. And that's really what this is. It's a crime, what's happening to these men and women across the United States. And it is the tip of the iceberg. We know if we're conservative, 5% of our prison population is innocent. And that's conservative. It's probably closer to 10%. Out of 2 million. Out of 2 million. And you can do the numbers and figure out how many people we've got languishing in our prison systems that simply weren't there. Uh, yes, uh, th thank you very much for your presentation this morning. It was most riveting. Um, my question is, the, the problem as it currently exists seems to rely on the different uh, manner in which the states conduct their uh, judicial systems in terms of evidence and other related issues. I was wondering if there are any particular states who are more efficient or more accurate in this regard where these instances occur less frequently that might provide a model for those states that are more egregious uh, with this problem. And also, whether or not um, there is uh, the possibility of finding a remedy to this problem at the federal le level which would be consistent with our Constitution in terms of uh, establishing uh, standards. The Innocence Project has a package of model legislation uh, that we try to pass in every state. And it, it, as Jennifer said, it's hodgepodge, state by state, even sometimes jurisdiction by jurisdiction. Uh, some states have no compensation statutes, so you, you don't get a dime. Uh, we got lucky in Mississippi this year and passed a, a, a piece of legislation that we had to sneak through the legislature almost uh, to pay 50,000 bucks a year. And we made it retroactive to two guys who got out last year after serving um, 15 years on death row. Uh, if, you, if you look at the whole package of this legislation, it covers best practices, many of which Jennifer alluded to. Th this is stuff that we could easily fix and not cost a lot of money. It would save a lot of money. These cases are terribly expensive. Look at, look at the money spent to put him in prison for 11 years. And then keep him there. We're spending 40,000 bucks a year to incarcerate 2 million people and 8,000 bucks a year to educate. We're not thinking. I mean, we, we've lost track. You know, it's, it's this build more prisons, lock up all the criminals. So we're just warehousing all of these inmates, many of whom are not violent criminals. Nobody has any sympathy for the violent people, but we're not thinking about all the nonviolent. Um, North Carolina is one of six states that passed a law that said you have to record by audio or video every police interrogation, I think in a capital case. Is that right, Alex? Just capital cases, isn't it? Okay. Um, I, I may be wrong there, but, but you've got to turn the machine on. They've got the machine right there. Okay, they don't turn it on for the first 14 hours. And when the guy's delusional, can't think straight, and would say anything to get out of the room, they, they, he finally confesses. Then they turn the machine on. And he confesses, and that's what the jury sees, and he goes off. And this, listen, this is not fiction, okay? I've, I've met with these guys in prison 25 years later. And it breaks your heart when you leave prison and they're still there. And the real killer's still out there. 
I tell my more conservative friends all the time, when you put an innocent man in prison, you've just increased the crime rate. Seven rapes right here, while Poole was still out. So I don't know what your question was, but I'm, just, I'm here ranting like crazy, okay? <laughs> this is a hot button for me, okay? I can just go on forever. The answer is, well, there's some great legislation that we try to push in all 50 states. Uh, it's a problem everywhere. Uh, it's a problem, I think, more in the southern states, although Chicago, Chicago's had, I mean, Illinois has had 19 exonerations. Dallas County has had 19 DNA exonerations in the past few years, 19. And even the Dallas Morning News of all publications is finally saying maybe we ought to stop this death machinery and look at it. So we're pushing in all 50 states. Well, John, I'm one of your good conservative neighbors and friends, I hope. And within, uh, within, within four days of your last appearance at the at the Paramount Theater here in town, Mr. Cotton, I want you to know that our equally conservative member of the House of Delegates heard your story. And Denise Lunford, who is our county prosecutor, just confirmed my memory, which is not trained as a lawyer, but the Virginia Code has been changed as a direct result of your appearance three or four years ago. The burden is now on the state of the, Com the Commonwealth of Virginia to help clean up records. It has to do with the, the huge problem of computers. Once you've been convicted, computers know it forever. And the burden now in Virginia, because you were here three or four years ago, because people like John made it happen, and I'm really very grateful to you. I was in tears when you left here um, the last visit. I was, did it again just now. And I want you to know you are making a difference by your appearances and telling this story, and it's already happened. And here's a prosecutor of this county who would confirm what I just said. Neither one of us can quote the details, but we know it happened. Uh, Ron, I, I found it incredible that uh, early on in your prison term, you actually identified a credible witness, prime suspect yourself, uh, who turned out to, in fact, be the perpetrator. Uh, my question is, uh, how quickly were you able to get DNA uh, evidence uh, to help you uh, with your case? In other words, uh, from the time you found out that this science was available, uh, to the time you were able to, in fact, get this DNA study, uh, was there obstacle? Were there obstacles in your path, or was it very difficult for you to get that study? Because one would assume that that would be the first thing that you would attempt to do. Well, as I was saying earlier, I had written to the courts of appeal out of Raleigh and to Tiger Ray Hunter and requested this, and uh, he forwarded my letter to the UNC Law School professor, Rich Rosen, and. It just so happened that he decided to pick up my letter and read it, and he went to work on it, and that's when they responded, stating that it was going to regret, you know, grant my request, and went to work. And I said maybe like 30, 30, I said three weeks, if four weeks, you know, I got the results back. Uh, it just so happened that the, this, well, the police chief, which was Detective Gallen at the time, he said he felt kind of funny about the case and saved the evidence. And one for him saving that evidence, you know, I've been still in prison right today. He just happened to put it in a box and slide it into a, an evidence room in a corner. Thank God for that, you know. Which is another part of the uh, legislation package, the preservation of DNA evidence. A lot of jurisdictions, uh, you know, don't preserve it now, even nowadays. And so we're trying to get that passed everywhere. It was just a few years ago that um, California and Florida were randomly throwing out hundreds of rape kits a day, just tossing them into dumpsters. And we were able to um, write some op-ed pieces and um, write to some of the departments and just explain to them you know, what exactly are they're doing when they're throwing out these rape kits. But this is, again, one of these things that, that is... Um, you know, state by state, department by department. Um, in Ron's case, everybody was very willing to run the DNA test, first of all, because we thought it was going to show that it was Ronald Cotton. But second of all, wouldn't you want to know? I mean, wouldn't you want to know? But we've got a case in Alaska right now where the prosecutor is refusing to allow a post-conviction DNA test to be run, even though he said he knows it's going to show the guy's innocent. But they don't have a post-conviction DNA law in Alaska. So again, this is state by state. Depends on, you know, if, if, if you're in New Jersey or if you're in 
you know, Alaska. Most rape victims don't want to discuss their the crime. Uh, most people who make a serious mistake don't like to say, I made a mistake, uh, please forgive me. And most people who've been the victims of this sort of situation, as both of you have been, uh, don't have the strength uh, to grant forgiveness. Uh, it's an unusual story. It's a terrific book. Thank you all very much. Thank you.